Hear that? It means we're live once again. You're going to pick up some stuff about bass you need to pick up. We've got some updates for you. We're going to give something else away. It's just a gift that keeps on giving. Of course, you're at Pensado's Place. Man, I had to go get my chakras realigned today. <laughs> I left chi all over that damn Lars Theater. Absolutely. <laughs> How you That's, doing, my friend? Chi is a good word for what we left. <laughs> I'm chi <-less. laughs> I I'd say so. Man, well, I tell you what. Um, every day, more and more blessings come our way as a result of uh, of this thing that we started a few months ago, uh, and. Uh, Oh, poor Drew, Drew and I, Drew more than me, we, we, were, we were stressed and tired, hadn't slept in a couple of days, and it was still one of the most fun days. Mm -hmm. I put it in my top 20 all-time fun days. Mm -hmm. it, was just, uh, it, it was just so much fun, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm talking about Mix Fest, guys, for those of you that weren't there. Um, we did Mix Fest, is, and all you guys know about that. Mm -hmm. What was your take on it? Um... God, we should actually write a book. But the short version is, uh, first of all, you guys are incredible. incredible. Uh, the support was insane. Uh, what was a two and a half hour thing turned into four and a half, five hours. Um, Jean-Marie Horvat and Eric Valentine were incredible. Uh, Jean-Marie yeah. flew in last minute. Jean-Marie's a rock star. With, <laughs> with Beyonce's blessing to do it. There's a number of stories. Um, obviously, we knew, we said to you guys, we wanted to try this as an, as an example and a way to work things out so that we can take this and make it go bigger and broader. And um, we thought it was going to be for L.A. and its local environments. And at last check, we had Peru, Norway, Germany, London, two people from France, two or Brazil. three people from France, Brazil, let alone Chicago, New Orleans, Detroit, New York. Panorama City. Panorama City, Compton, San Francisco, and Culver City. Uh, <laughs> needless to say, we are blown away. Blown away. Um, I mean, it's, it's humbling. It's, it was so yeah. much fun to meet a lot of the cats that we've come to know from just seeing their name in Facebook. And uh, uh, we, got, we got to meet probably 40 or 50 people and, and, and attach a face to that name. And I learned a lot. I mean, I, I could sit and watch Jean-Marie and Eric all day long, and then during my segment, uh, as always, our audience asked some of the greatest questions, you know, that, that kind of forced me to get out of my comfort zone and think a little bit, and uh, I, I can't wait to do another one, Herb. I know, I know you're tired because oh, you, you did most God. of the work. But. Uh, and a big shout-out to Will. Shout-outs to lots of people, and we'll put that up on our, on our page. Yeah. Um, every, everybody worked really hard, but we couldn't have done it without you. Um, and then clearly what we couldn't have done because we were able to give a lot of stuff away was uh, big thanks to Naris, big thanks obviously to Lars for hosting it, um, big thanks to McDSP, and then, you know, our pals, Avid, who threw down and were very helpful, and then obviously, you know, our buddies, our family, Vintage King, and Vintage King, of course, is in the house. We've got Ryan McGuire in the chat room. Oh, Ryan, what's up? And in, you see his name up on the page. And in classic Vintage King form, da, 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 I we, thought I got to be Vanna White yeah, today. Yeah, but you just got to know how to do it. So I here, wore the bra here, you, and everything. Go ahead. Oh, it's, it's not evident. So you hold it up so we can take you, and I'll do the voiceover. So we're going to, in four weeks, give away a 1073 that Vintage King is offering. You see it right there. It's in Dave's hands. You can enter in to win right below. You see right below the... 1073 this weekend dot promo jam dot com forward slash neve we're giving this away december 15th um our sponsors love you you guys love them so let's get you entered into that stuff a couple other things on mix fest and we'll move forward because we got a, as you heard the bass notes underneath you got we got a great guy can I steal 30 seconds from you? sure you can uh our team was incredible and then there's a new honorary member of our team that went way above and beyond the call of duty i'm talking about divine uh, special thanks to him, and if you ever need a computer or any of the services that Divine provides, he's the best there is. Yeah, Will, Will feels that same way too, so that's perfect. Um, then, the, uh, so last thing, a couple things that we left undone. Um, fulfillment on those people who bought tickets 
for bags and keys. Those will start going out next week so that, you know, so we get it all aligned. Um, as for the mix contest, we're attaching an easy way to make sure that you can put, so, so the, just the methodology of how that enters. So go to pensadoplace.tv and we're going to have information on that starting next week on what you do with the USB keys and so forth. And then there are, we have a lot of requests for people who just want the keys. Let us make sure we can just manage that process properly and we'll probably make those available too. We just want to do it in an orderly way, so give us four or five days to do it. Um, other than that, you know where to contact us. Um, that page always pops up, so there it is. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all those places. Get your comments to us, get your likes to us. There is a ton going on. It's all because of you, and we're going to just keep trying to make it work for you and enhance it and move it forward. So, enough of the business affairs. Let's get to, you know that the, our, our CJ, not the DJ, is over, in, over there. There's Drew Adams. Mm -hmm. What Drew up, was people? Very popular during Mix Fest. We actually gave uh. Drew away. <laughs> <laughs> so, Drew might not be with us for a couple of weeks while he goes to the other people's homes and acts okay. like a prize. Okay. Uh, and then we'll bring him back. Uh, okay. But, Drew, good to see you. Likewise, likewise. You're doing a great job. I'm sure you're tired as well, too. So, Everybody. let's get to our guest. Man, um, Wizard. W-Y-Z-A-R-D is more than a guest. He's one of my dearest, closest friends, someone that's been an inspiration to me most of my musical career. I, I, anybody that knows me know I always say about Wizard Herb, I can, I can play something pretty good. Wizard can just walk in the room, not even do anything, just stand there and I play things I've never played before. He's got that kind of energy and I vibe. I started playing at the top of the show. That was you playing bass at the beginning, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. And I just picked up, first time I ever picked it up. But I can't emphasize enough if you take anything away from today's show I want you to I want you to understand and, and see this man's uh, passion his vision his uh, commitment to to music his total love of music um, it, he lives it and um, I, I think you're gonna learn a lot today so uh, let me set you up a little bit guys um, Wizard is part of a band called Mother's Finest which is has to be one of the, one of the greatest top 25 bands of all time. Nobody can perform like they can. Um, and there's reasons for that. I'll, we'll get into that. Uh, the band is just incredible. They blow people off the stage for 40 years and are still doing it today. Uh, Wiz played with Stevie Nicks. Um, if you watch the Saturday Night Live episode with her on it, that's, that's Wizard playing bass. He's currently working with Bob Clearmount on a, on a record for Song Dogs. A real cool group. He's played with uh, rock bands, um, uh, Blackfoot with Ricky Medlock. Uh, Wizard's brother Harold is—he's as every bit as good a, good a drummer as Wizard is a bass player. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine a rhythm section like that in the same family? And um, uh, he's, the Who. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Rather than waste time doing this, these names are going to come or, up organically as we go. Wizard, I love you. You're my, you're my coolest friend on you're earth. Welcome. Thanks for coming by. It is such a pleasure to be here. And uh, when I, to the family. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. When I found out about your show, matter of fact, you told me about it, uh -huh. and I Googled it online, and it was such a pleasure. The chemistry between you two. <laughs> it reminds me of like Charlie Rose or like some of those cool. <laughs> Charlie Rose okay, I didn't get to be Vanna White. Can I at least be Charlie Rose? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you Who know, are you, the yeah. Hamburg Foundation, if I'm Charlie Rose? I think that's yeah. reverse, but it's okay. okay. But it's such great information for people. Everybody who I send uh, to your site comes back to me saying how cool it is and how much they learn. So oh, cool. it's very necessary. It has uh, has Glenn and Joyce seen it? Yeah, Murdoch uh, checks you out all the time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he watches your show and he goes into his studio <laughs> and starts, wow. you know, finding the points to that, that actually, update. Actually, that, something like that came out of Mixfest. A really well-known friend of ours named John Nettlesby, um, who is at the heart of the creative stuff with Michael Jackson, and has been around for a long time, and is a good friend of ours. Um, a, a well-known celebrity who I won't mention his kids, a couple of them actually, want to learn mixing. Yeah. And they got together with John to teach them. And after six or eight weeks, John finally, this is what he told me anyway, John finally said, look, just watch Pensado's place. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they, they began. They so they commission that, don't they? Uh, well, we do. Oh. And they become fans and so on right. and so forth. So it's, it's nice to hear that, that 
that yeah. people get some value out of it. People want to know how to get the low end that this guy gets. I'll never forget, this was back in the 90s when you did the, the mix for Pink, uh, that I'm coming, uh, 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 get the party started. Uh -huh. I was taking my son to school, and he was in elementary school, and, and, and they had a, uh, it was a festival for Halloween. And I was about four blocks away, and I heard that, oh, God. <laughs> and, I, and I told him, I said, <laughs> I told my son, I said, that's Pensado's mix. And the closer we got, the more, I mean, the, the, you know, just the low end. Yeah. It's, 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 it's just... That's probably why we're friends. We live down there around 60, 80 cycles. Right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's got a lot to do we with it. We don't live up the block at uh, 10K Lane. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that brings out a point, Wiz. One of the things that, that I learned from you that I apply to this day is, is how to position and, 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 and the role that the bass plays in, 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 in music. Because you've got a gift for just playing the right part and the right octave. And, and, and just blending in. I've recorded you a hundred times, or it feels like it, maybe not that much, but uh, we've done a lot of songs together. And you just always walk in and just play the right part. I mean, you just have a gift for taking... When, 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 when you were first learning, when you were first forming your opinions about, about, your, about the instrument, you could have easily chosen the guitar, but for some reason you like that 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 octave and, and, and when you think yeah. of when you think of what you add to a mix can is it is it is it something you just instinctively do is there a process you can share with us that we might can apply to the mixing world about how you think about applying the bass to that yeah that is a loaded question i can go for blocks and blocks to answer that <laughs> go for it. let's go. get no let's, let's get right to the heart of it when i uh hear bass i hear it being the heart of the song I mean, because most of the songs I love, the bass is always the heart of it, you know. And, um, you know, I came up from, like, uh, my older brother, Edward, was a guitar player, but he used to grab the bass, and he would play the bass just like a guitar. He would bend the strings, and, and I was, like, four or five years old, and I said, whoa, how cool is that? He was eh, and doing all this cool stuff like, mm -hmm. like it was a guitar solo, but it was on the bass. And so that was my first attraction to the bass. And, like, it showed me a way where you can carry the song, and, you know, like, Bands like Soundgarden and, and uh, you know, like a lot of rock music, people think it's the guitar mm -hmm. that's the power, but most of the time it's the bass line. Mm. And, and especially... I like to say the, the guitar is credibility, but the bass is the power. The bass is the power and the heart and, like, the, it's the bigness, you know? Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you just take the guitar off, it's just, I mean, it's still there, you know, mm -hmm. the same thing. But if you take the bass away... Something Nothing. definitely goes away. Mm. So you know, but you uh, think consciously about filling that that lower octave. I mean, when you sit down to play, it's not there. You listen to the song and you go, "Oh, it needs filling that blank." And that's exactly it. I listen to what the song needs, mm -hmm. and I always listen to the song first. I just did a um, seminar at Paul Reed Smith. And it was about eight bass players. We were all together. And I love all these guys. I mean, great players. A lot of pluckety, pluckety, pluckety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> going on. And like, that is so out of my element. You know, like, mm -hmm. I could live without ever having to play a triplet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, you know, because I grew up, you know, listening to like Led Zeppelin, like a whole lot of love. I could play that riff for hours and never get mm -hmm. tired of it. Mm -hmm. One riff. Mm -hmm. And you know, like, uh, a lot of the modern bass players, you know, they were freaking out because they couldn't just stay down on on just the groove. Like, yeah, we played Truth to Set You Free, that song My Mother's Finest, which mm -hmm. is just a riff. And it never changes. Mm. And it's get better and better and better. And, and, and a lot of people, a lot of players don't, un, you know, they don't feel comfortable there. Mm -hmm. I feel completely comfortable there because I like the elements that's on top of it, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to be able to hold that. What's well, funny is most, but a lot of bass players are failed guitar players, so they think that in order to be respected as a bass player you got to play like a guitar player and it's the guys like you that just hold that solid relationship with the kick drum and the drummer that people end up admiring you know well you know i i, I grew up watching so many great bass players like larry graham i saw him with sly and the family stone back when they were there was it was a life album mm. it was even before stan and that band was so magical but the bass player larry when he stepped on his fuzz tone, mm -hmm. I went to the music store the next day. I bought four fuzz tones. Because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, and, and like I've been doing distortion ever since then. And uh, tell uh, Drew, just yell. I don't know, or you, I don't know if your mic's on. But just yell. Uh, there's a um, there's a YouTube video you guys have. First, check out Mother's Finest.
Uh, my favorite album by them is Another Mother Further, and uh, every song on that record's a hit. But when, when I played you, um, uh, when That's I played you the five minute solo, that, uh, on YouTube it's, it's Wizard, W Y Z A R D. Uh, Will, maybe you can make a graphic. I think it says solo. Yeah, it says, well, insane, well, it says insane bass solo. Insane bass solo. solo. You yeah. guys will not believe this. I, I've heard this, this solo, I've seen him do it live. Ten times, and, and every time I hear it, I just I just lock my guitar up, and I just there's no point. Yeah, in playing we had, for we had like three people in the room, and we watched the whole thing through and through. And it's just like off somebody's cell phone or something like that. It's not yeah, great right, quality, yeah. but you get totally captivated by it. It's it's it's, it's like nothing else. It's one of the oh, there it is. Yeah. I know Mo, God. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling you, people, yeah. um, uh, you. you if it comes from his mouth, listen, because Wizard is is um, is one of the all-time great rock bass players. He can hold his own with funk. Uh, he mentioned Larry Graham, the, who I kind of credit for that style of slap bass. Yeah. I guess Larry did it. Invent Larry, the, the Larry did it out of necessity because they didn't have a drummer when he worked with his mom, and he had to keep time. Oh, is that And he basically did it as a timepiece and the bass, so oh. it, it was necessary. It wasn't for show. And, and and that was the way that I always approached it also. Like it was, like people look at me and they think I'm gonna pluck it. I'm not plucking, I just like to drive down on the bass like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's a different kind of power. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to any of that, li especially live uh, Sly and the Family Stone stuff like the Woodstock era and stuff, man, the bass sounds like a big truck coming at you. You know, it's just <laughs> so, mm -hmm. it's like a train. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the power and the consistency gotta, of it. Bass, bass guitar, you have to experience it live at a show. It's yeah. a record I try, I try, I try, I try, I try to get that, what, what, what I feel when I'm at a show, but one day maybe I'll get it. Things are going a little harder for me with earbuds and laptops, but I'm going to keep trying. Yeah, but no, you've got to go see a show. Is Mother's Finest playing? Uh, Man, we're playing a lot. Uh, we, we just played uh, in the Southeast uh, two weeks ago. Amazing show. We played outside. I mean, when we play outside, that's the best place because we're like a big band. We played this summer with Santana over in, uh, in Austria, mm. and that was amazing. God, he sounds so good. Dennis uh, Chambers is playing drums, and we were on before. I mean, it was a great package. And, uh, One of the reasons you might not see Mother's Finest is because early on they, they were managed by uh, Aerosmith's management. And uh, Stephen, I apologize if I say something that offends you, but <laughs> they couldn't open for Aerosmith. The audience would leave after Mother's Finest set and wouldn't even li wait for Aerosmith to come on. I mean, they, they, they blew, like at the pop festivals, like the big pop festival, you know, 500,000 people, people that leave after their set, they, mm. were, they had a reputation for blowing Hendrix off the stage. Mm. They, they toured with The Who, they blew them off the stage. And, and, and they don't do it with arrogance. These guys actually all got a house. I can't imagine what that house was like. That had to be the raddiest looking house, but they, it was very good every house person there. in the band lived together yeah. for years and years and years. They woke up, they practiced. They ate lunch, they practiced. They, they practiced all their waking hours in Atlanta, and they were legendary for, for this in Atlanta. In fact, they kind of, in the South, they kind of made that the archetypal process for a band. You start a band, you, everybody moves into a house, you practice for, how, how long did you guys live in that was, house practicing? I was 17, I was 17 when, 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 when I joined Mother's Finest, and Mo, we were the same age. Uh -huh. And the first time I played with Mo, it was like it was so easy to play with him because everything I was thinking, he's, we'd think on the same page. And we wanted to play, you know, every chance we got. And we wanted to fine tune each bar. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, we did get mm -hmm. so tight to where, like, well, I would. You, you and BB, I mean, oh, the BB, drummer. Right. The original drummer. The drummer they have now, Dion's still with you now? Yeah. Uh, Dion's incredible, too. I don't, I'm not going to take anything away from him, but... We spent uh, tons of time with B.B. That's what it was. We well, used to you, rehearse with, like, B. B. a B.B. would fart, track. and you'd have a note I right know. in time and in <laughs> harmony. That's yeah. how close they were together. Yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was like nothing you've ever seen her. And, and the yeah. records, um, the Tom Werman record, that's uh, another mother further. I mean, that's yeah. just a live record in the studio. You we guys just don't cut. overdub. You know what was so cool about that record is, like, I think we did no more than two takes for any song on that record as far as the basic I, tracks I, I because know. we had gone over it so much and we were just coming off of a tour mm -hmm. so we went in the sound pit in Atlanta yeah, and you know Myron uh, Bogdan uh, Mylon Bogdan Mylon Bogdan yeah. uh, from the Lefevers yeah right he, he was actually the did a stint with um, 
with uh, a version of The Who. Wow, okay. Yeah, he, that guy's he, he great. No He's joke. great. I he, actually yeah. played with him. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, over at the bistro on 10th Street in between okay. a set of uh, Dixie Dregs. Oh, Dregs. That oh, was, God. That that was, that was, that was <laughs> good. <laughs> I love that band, yeah. I, I yeah. canceled that gig five times. I just couldn't play in front of Steve Morris, but he was very Steve gracious. Morris, yeah. I mean, the whole band. We, we, we did a lot of shows with those guys. They were incredible. They were incredible. Hey, man. Yeah. Um, is it better now? Like one of the problems and one of the reasons a lot of you people haven't heard of Mother's Finest is because they were too black for white radio, they were too white for black radio, and so they were in this no man's land format wise. They'd go to they'd play rock shows and they'd they'd do the as good as any rock band ever, then they'd play a, a, an R and B show and one of the things about Mother's Finest is they didn't try to be a rock band or a funk band. That's just who they were. They were a collection of guys that just and girls that girl, and girl yeah. <laughs> that live together, and uh, Joyce is she can stand toe to toe with with any rock singer, anybody, and she can stand toe to toe with Shaka Khan, uh, anybody, yeah. and Joyce like Joyce not much taller than this pen, she's just a little bitty girl and all that sound. I know, but, yeah, but she's amazing. What advice would you give people now that can get caught in that same format? And her, you know this really well, well because you, you had to good. fight formats with Brian McKnight. Yeah, I'm curious to hear his perspective. Well, you know... Um, is it better now? You know, I think what's better now is... Uh, is living color, groups like that have had trouble recently? Yeah, I think what's better now is you can sell your music yourself right. online and you can actually you can create your own... You don't have to play the radio game. Right, now. you can actually create your own market. And I think that's what's cool. Like my son came to me yes, just yesterday, and he said he got these friends from Sweden that he met, and they were like, he said they were in their early 20s, and he mentioned that I was in the band, and they freaked out. And he said, and, and, uh, and like he freaked out that they knew me because they go to the school he goes to, which is an international school, Crossroads and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these kids were saying, oh man, your papa and mother's son is my favorite band. And, and, and he said, like, how kids, did you know? Yeah, I know, yeah. you know, yeah. so it's, it's, it's just that I think when you stay true to yourself, you do cross lines. I mean, you know, you know, you're not put in a little time trendy box, mm -hmm. and that tends to happen. Like when you follow the radio or you follow what everybody's success is, mm -hmm. it lasts as long as that success is. And once it changes, and you lost what the, it the used metrics, to be, you know, the metrics yeah. have changed. Like radio still has a corporate game that they feel like they have to play by, where it's, it while it's not as segregated and things cross over that box is superseded now by the bigger box called the internet where people can make their own decisions right. and, and there's a hybrid and people are much more interested in things. So. And, 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 and you know something else, a friend of mine pointed out to me, there are no black bands that play instruments like the Ohio Players or like Earth, Wind & Fire or like the Commodores. I mean, I was so many cool bands doing that thing where they, they were playing and they were creating the, the a sound. The Roots might be The it. Roots is, is it. Matter of <laughs> fact, that drummer said it too. He said, we're the only signed yeah. band mm -hmm. that actually They're play incredible. instruments. They're How incredible. incredible is that? How sad is that? How sad is that? Yeah. It's yeah. terrible. In fact, while I mean, we're at it, let me get an engineering footnote in. Any Roots record that Bob Power is on, listen to it and you'll hear where I stole half the stuff I, well, <laughs> stole 5% of the stuff I used because Bob Power is my hero. But also, too, like, like, like Europe seems to be a little more advanced about that than us because, like, like Mother's Finest went over there a while back, played, I think it was Norway, just one gig, and you were like the yeah. top band in Norway for 20 years, you know? Yeah. And you still can draw 60,000 people in Europe. Yeah. Well, maybe 59. Right. And, um, <laughs> and so Europe is definitely a... I don't know if it's advanced more. as much as it's just that their well, a musical appreciation. What I do love about the European market is, uh, like, we'll do, like, the open air shows, mm -hmm. and they'll have a jazz band on, and then a thrash band That's on, awesome. and then mm -hmm. an R&B band on, and a punk band on. And so, like, it's different kind of music, and the audience can sit there through that. Through all of it. Yeah. yeah, and they can appreciate it for the good that it's in, you know, you, yeah. know, you know that it is. I was just, that Amnesty sh uh, uh, song that we just did, the Five Blind Boys, that oh, band from way oh, back, man, from Alabama. they're on this. they got to be in their 70s or 80s. Well, you know, we, we played the Sweden, uh, the uh, Swedish Jazz Festival two years ago, and they were on before us. Wow. 
And these guys, you know, they, they hold each other's shoulder right. and they walk on the stage like, like a chain link, right, you know? Right, and right. they get to the microphone and then they hit this harmony that's just, oh man. And I mean, their blend Ooh. is, I mean, it's gotta be like, how, how long have they been around? I mean, Ira okay. Sullivan and the Five Blind Boys, oh, my mo that was my mother's favorite band. Wow. And they still doing it and they're it's on this record. members too, I think, it looks like. Hmm? It looks like it's mostly the original members, too. Well, you know, yeah, all the ones that are alive are there. But just the fact that they were on before Mother's Finest, and they were great, and, you know, rocked the house. The mm. people loved me. I had to come back three times for encores, and then we came on, and we had to start a whole nother vibe. Right. And then that was great. It ended up. And then behind us was some jazz pianist that he had to come and, you know. Incredible. So, oh, yeah. Following you, know, yeah. you guys. Yeah. That's the thing hey, about you. It's great, yeah. Um, in terms of... In term, like you do a lot of sessions, in terms of um, being guided by a producer, what would you say are, are some things that, from your perspective as the player, and you're also a producer, and he also, well, Mother's Finest is a, is a collective writing thing, but you're, you're one of the spearheads and main writers in the group. You've written all the hits, uh, written on all the hits. Uh, I like the way you say this person. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want Glenn and Joyce to jump me. Hey, that's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. <laughs> um, um, what, what, what's some advice you could give the producers in terms of how to get what they want from a bass player? Is, is, it, is it just m pick a great one and turn them loose? What do you feel most comfortable and what do you like most when you go into a session? What kind of preparedness does the producer need to have? I think it's it, it's important for the producer to know what style he wants and to know what the player's strength is. That will make it easier because uh, that was one session I did for you for uh, the Korean guy, and it was uh, he wanted to do something that was like Kurt Franklin, which was oh, like, that was J.Y. Park, right, 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 mm -hmm. which was Coward great talent. But like I had to pull that off because that was so out of my element. Because mm -hmm. like progressive gospel is probably the most challenging music to play, especially for a keyboard player, bass player. Mm. I mean, the bass lines in gospel is—I mean, if you're not on it daily. You know, you just whatever, but you know, I pulled that off, but I, I was sweating bullets in that session <laughs> because that was not my strength. Right. And like, you know, he wanted me to do more of a lead based thing to where I did more runs and it was like busier and it was like, you know, a lot of movement and stuff. Mm. So it would have been great for him to get a, uh, you know, one of those guys from a church in Compton would have just killed that. Mm -hmm. Would have been right down his alley. Mm -hmm. But that same guy would not necessarily play on something like for. Like if Dr. Dre wanted something that just stayed there and didn't move and just was, you know, give me that vibe and, mm -hmm. and lock it in. So I think the first thing is, you know, having someone that style fits, you know, the concept of the production. And then if not, you know, you know, you have to work with a player. I mean, to make sure because the song is important. So bottom line is you want to make the song exciting for the listeners. And uh, Do you, excuse me, do you... Like, I personally like bass lines that become little hooks or big hooks. You know, right. I, I like hooky bass lines. Like, one of the things I liked about um, 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 uh, what, a mother's finest song? No, Rick, no. Um, Cocaine's a Hell of a Drug. Or Rick James? Uh, is the fact that his bass lines were incredibly rhythmic, but they were also little songs in and of themselves. I mean, you could right. play you could play the bass line on an acoustic guitar and have the song. Exactly. But but he held down the rhythm. Exactly. Uh, is is that something that you see as important in, in today's music or do you see it vanishing? It's important for mainly for dance music, I think you find that in and for things like, you know, that's like driven stuff that's oh. got, you know, that drives. Mm -hmm. um, people write from different concepts or different perspectives all the time. If you're writing a song that's like lyric driven, then the bass line comes under that. And sometimes people can write, you know, a bass line can be like the most dominant. Just like that song, I'm mean, going way back to the OJs, like Money, that song Money, 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 Money. Yeah. They gave the bass player percentages of the, of the, of the writing because the bass line was. Oh, now he's, now, he's, now he's trying to like get some money. He's trying to. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. you're subtle. I <laughs> subtle. Like, I bet we can hear But the bass so, line, um, as soon as you hear the bass line, I mean, you say, okay. No, you're like, right. you know? Yeah, and you can just live with that. And there's a lot of songs like that, especially like in the hip hop world, like well, bass line. Well, not lately. All of the prog music we're hearing now. Mm -hmm. I think everybody experiment with plugins right now. And pretty soon it'll get back to. Let's, let's transition to ITL so he can, pick, okay. he can actually be showing us some of these okay. answers. 
Uh, on the way to ITL, just spend a second, because this is, this is an important thing you're doing with Amnesty International. You work with uh, Pharrell yes. and a bunch of people. Well I, well, I get my ITL questions together. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, the German band I work with, Carl Carlton and the Song Dogs, I've been, we've done um, five albums, and we, we've just basically been in Europe. But we're coming to America next year. We work with Levon Helms a lot. We recorded the last two records at his studio up in Woodstock, New York. And God, he is such a legend. Levon, we yeah, talk about it. Yeah, he was, he, he was uh, Bob Dylan's first, first uh, uh, backup band. Mm. When Bob Dylan went wow. out on tour for the first time, he was the drummer. And the band were, 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 you know, they were the players. And then they realized that they had some magic together and they went on to do their own thing. Kind of like what War did when they were with Eric Burton. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the band went on to be legendary. And Levon, he's, God, Levon, he's like in his 70s or whatever, and he had this thing called the Midnight Ramble that happens on two Saturdays a month. And he's got about a 15-piece band, horns, keyboards, I mean, stellar musicians. Mm. And they play in this, in, in like a studio, which is a converted barn with perfect wood. I mean, drums sound like heaven in there. You hear the, <laughs> you hear the snare drum? Perfect wood. I mean, like the, I mean, you know, it's a yeah, big no, A-frame yeah. wooden building. Mm. And I mean, drums sound so great, and he got like five horns and two keyboard players and guitars and upright bass. One question, though. Yes. What's this got to do with Amnesty International? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm getting there right now. <laughs> we recorded well, Amnesty. Well, Herb gets that look, you better hurry. Oh, no, I'm good. Okay, 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 okay we good. It's, it's, it's the 50th anniversary of Amnesty International. Wow. And there were like a lot of songs submitted, like Green Day submitted material, like all these bands. And Carl wrote this song, the guy who's in the Song Dogs. Mm -hmm. And they liked his song. It's a wow. brilliant song. Carl's a great songwriter. And they said, we want this song. And so um, we've been, we, we tracked this song in Levon's place. And it's a great production. Bob Clear Mountain is doing, the, you know, he helped us with the engineering. And he's producing it and he's mixing it. And uh, Justin, who is uh, Levon's engineer producer, he's there. And so it's a lot of great people doing it. A lot of great people. Kev Moe, Taj Mahal, Pharrell, mm -hmm. um, Marion Faithful, Jimmy Barnes, um, uh, a lot of African artists, a lot of French artists, Australian artists. Um, I mean, it's, it's, like a, uh, it's like a global thing. And it's going to be uh, premiered the end of this month, November. I think it'll will come you in. Let, it, will you let, let us know so we can say something about the show. I will definitely let you let know. Let me let me start with that as a as a way to get into ITL. What did Clear Mountain do to get y you into Pro Tools? D what was the signal path out of the guitar into a DI box, and then you split that. One side went to an amp. One side went straight to the console, and then you mixed those later. Well, when we talked to Bob at first, when we when we first got him to to be a part of it, he said the most important thing to me is to be there for the tracking because he said the most important thing to him was uh, mic positioning and the techniques that we were using to get the source to the board, like what you're saying. And he said, if you do that correctly, the mixing is so much easier. He said, if you give me a good sound to mix, then it makes my job so much easier. So it's really important that, you know, like, like the mic positioning uh -huh. and the mic so selection. He just, he, so he just, he just mic'd your amp? Well, mic my amp and I was direct. Oh, okay. And I was mic with two different mics. Do you remember what they were? Uh, I don't remember the models, no, because they got so many different things. But one of them was like a bass drum mic, which is, um, you know, that they use like on the kick drum. D112? Maybe it was a one D112, right. And then it was another um, one for high fidelity. But the bass sounds amazing. And do, do, you know if, do you know if he used more of the, of the DI or more of the, the amp? I mix. think it was a blend. They love the DI because that, this, I used that bass right there, the, my Fender bass that I've used for years, and it's got a great sound through the DI, which is another good thing. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have an instrument that, that has a good tone. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, the, the simplicity of, of, like, recording never changes. If you've got a good instrument and a good player and, a, and the technique of getting it to the source, those are the things that you have to really be really elementary about to get a good sound in the end because mm. then other than that you know it for yourself you end up having to doctor everything up to, mm. to make it sound decent yeah. but if you got something that sound great all you have to do is spend time thinking about how you can just 
you know, more they time can mixing, less time repairing. Yes. Uh, did did you did you use any pedals in, uh, uh, before the uh, before the DI and the amp, or did any processing come during the mix? For this uh, situation, no. I was I just used direct bass, which is a challenge for me. I love sometimes just playing with no effects. Mm -hmm. For when this, you, when you for do project, when you no, do use an effect, what what's, what, what what effects do you like to use in terms of uh, recording? Uh, I love distortion. I've got several different distortion boxes. A dream fuzz. This is guy just made for me in, from Germany. Uh, Thomas. He works with a com company called Tech Amp, and they're coming to America soon. He makes great bass amps, but he makes this killer uh, fuzz tone. And what's so amazing about it is it changes. Uh, the tone by, I mean, just as time goes by, the tone filters into, it morphs into a different sound. Mm -hmm. And so you never really know what you're going to get, but it's always really cool. And what, are you, what are you trying to accomplish by adding the, the, uh, the distortion? You just, you just want a little touch to help you f your ear find it in the mix, like en enrich, those, enrich those upper harmonics so your ear can find it? Sometimes a little touch just to make a grainier. Sometimes an abundance of it just to make it, you know, <laughs> ugly. Ugly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. the solo that the, the solo that everybody in the world is like so fascinated by. That was a lot of. Once I get to the end, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm stepping on everything. <laughs> you know. Love what yeah. boxes are you using near the end? I've got like a, a rat pedal, oh, which Proco? is uh, Proco. You mm -hmm. know what's so amazing about that is like uh, he was a friend of Michael Keck, the keyboard player from. From Mother's Finest, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the guy who owned Proco, and we were in Kalamazoo uh, that weekend, and like he he was talking to me about that pedal. He wanted to know what was needed to make a great uh, fuzz pedal, and I was telling him, I said the problem that most bass players have is there's no tone to where you can take out some of the highs because sometimes it's too bright, mm -hmm. and you want to be able to get some tones so that you can get more low end get fuzz un tone. Get underneath the guitar, and he added like the tone, and he's got the balance mixers where you can get your your clean sound balance with the distortion, and I thought those things were revolutionary. And his pedal is—it's got like an—it's kind of like a Neve tone. I mean, you know how mm -hmm. how, how analogy naturally good those things sound. That's the thing I love about the the Rat pedal. Mm -hmm. Is it something that's also so useful? Also, too, uh, uh, this is an amazing piece of gear. But our buddies at BAE would like to know how many of, of uh, their products are you using. You got you got a bunch of BAEs, don't you? Uh, yeah. How many? I've got like the six pack. All right. It's amazing. Yeah, but so and, and you telling me it sounds as good as this one? Well, you know, um, I don't want to get into that right okay, now. Okay, please. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the one thing about having the one thing about Herb and I having our own show is um, um, when you start describing equipment like the the knee versus the BAE. Right. It, it, it's really unfair because nobody worked harder than Brent and Mark Laughlin to create something that was as good as the original. And so um, you've got to give them credit for creating something. At the end of the day, they're, they're incredibly close, and it's just sometimes you like one, sometimes you like the other. But right, right, right. When you get to that level, you know, it's, it's, it's like... I use it for everything. I can go into it with, an, with like, uh, you know, guitar, bass, acoustics, mm -hmm. uh, drums. I use mm -hmm. it for, I mean, between that and, uh, and I have like the Avalon 737, which is great mm -hmm. for voice. I'm still tweaking that. I wish I was better at it. I like at the a, mic pre for bass on that. I mean, yeah. I like to plug just directly into that for bass. I use that for bass a lot, yeah. Now, when, you, when you're recording in the studio, a, a lot of a lot of young producers and engineers just starting out, they think that to get the sound of of, a, of the bass like it would be live, you've got to play at live volumes. But 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 I, I've seen you get the most fattest, baddest bass sound, and it's I could still talk over it. It was it was it was loud, but it wasn't like concert right. level loud. Uh, what what's what's your take on on like what, what's your instinct when you set up? Like you said, you record through this rig. This is your recording rig. What what level in the room? Give me an example of like the level in the room that you would like. You mean to actually yeah, play it? Sure. I mean, you know, like it depends on the situation. I I just like to blend with the drummer. As long as I can hear the drums and I can hear who I'm playing with enough. And then, and then just let the engineer. Yeah, you know, like I try not to get in the way because I know like if you are too loud, then you're gonna bleed in the other mics and. And it's going to be a problem, especially when you're doing something live. So it's nice just to get a, you know, what I was so impressed with it when I listened to those old tracks like 
something like Little Richard, Tutti Fruity. They said that was one mic in the middle of the room, mm -hmm. and 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 the band had to Play, adjust yeah. to the vocal level and keep it rocking. And so that kind of magic is where I, you know, I keep that in my in the back of my head whenever I'm playing because it's all about making the song work mm -hmm. and making the unit you're playing with work. And I hate sticking out, you know. Mm -hmm. I like to be in. I like to stick in with it. <laughs> I, I, I know this is an unfair question, uh, but have you ever played an upright bass? Have you ever, yeah. What, 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 do you like? How, those are kind of hard to fit into the into the sound of a song for me when I mix well, because you, you, they don't seem to be recorded in such a way to because it's, it's the high end is more important on that instrument than it would be on a, an electric bass. Is that a fair thing to say? Well, you know, to me, I think acoustic is more about feel. Like, you know, like when I see Levon, you know, that's the latest I've seen an upright bass, and he uses that to ramble, and it's like with the big band, and you feel the acoustic bass, you know? You don't hear it as much, you just mm -hmm. feel it. The only time I hear it I is when I guess in a way, they were solo. kind of the original slappers, but they, they were, did it. Right, right, right. That was, that was the country thing, and they had yeah. it down into the... This, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, it, it was really weird, but that's where originally slapping came from. Now, what, what in your idea will allow him to play something, so our audience can see um, uh, play me the play me the riff you play when you um, when you're warming up and setting your tone in the studio. It's it's a different riff every day. I mean, I just play something. Do it, do it again. Watch his face. Watch his face. That's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> you feel every note, I dude. I can't. You know. Uh, it, it, it's part of the it's not part of the process. It goes from here. Play me, it, play me the riff from um, Disco This Way, Disco That okay, Way. I love that song. Well, my favorite part of that. great when the guitar player doubles it. Mm -hmm. So me and the guitar player play the same line in itself. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful thing, yeah. <laughs> you, like, like one of my pet peeves, I, what bass player took, uh, took the D and the G string off his bass and only plays with the E and the A? Oh, There's a real famous bass player. He was in a punk band. All he played was with those two strings. Well, you know, a guitar player that did that was from the B-52s. Yeah. He took out the two center string. He had the E and the A and the B and the E. And the D and the G was gone. Yeah. And they didn't have a bass player. And he had four strings and they rocked so hard I couldn't believe it. Remember when they did like rock lobster? Yeah. That's four strings on a guitar. Yeah. I There's remember. no uh, <laughs> I love that band. I love that band. <laughs> yeah, I love that band, yeah. When you're when you're like like I I was watching you and you and you're moving around the neck, do you ever think to yourself, okay, I can't go play this note? On on the on the um, on the A string, let me play it five frets lower on the E so I can get a little rounder tone. Do you, are you thinking tone when you're playing? And, and I find that a lot of times, like you'll find a, a different positioning give you a different sound, different texture, easier positioning. Can you so, show us? Huh? Can you show us? Uh, like if I was going to do say for instance, like are you going? Uh, that's like three different positions mm -hmm. of the same lick. And it's a, and you know, if you were doing something like, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so it's this octaves. timing is like stupid good. Oh man, I was keeping it in my head, man. You're perfect. You were talking yeah. about my brother Harold earlier. Oh, uh, Harold's timing. My is brother, like... his younger brother. Uh, he called me one day and he said, hey man, he said, I'm on a record and uh, I'm playing drums and I think it's going to be a hit. And I didn't even know he was playing drums. And uh, you know, Bobby Caldwell, What You Want to Do for Love, that sure. song, that's my brother playing drums on that. Uh. That was a, and it was a number one song and, and uh, he had a hit before I did and it <laughs> freaked me out. And I mean, you know, he came out of nowhere man. playing drums. I got a question for you. What does, you know, a lot of our folks who are watching are recording at home. Is there, are there techniques for recording bass for people who are recording at home that you would advise t them to tell bass players or how they could record bass? What, 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 what advice yeah. would you give them? 
Um, I was just doing this last night. I, I was up so late last night. I'm writing a new song, and I love, and I got to the bass line. And uh, what's so cool with home studios, I play all the parts. I play guitar now, and I'm playing the bass, and I'm singing, and I'm writing, and I'm mixing, and I'm wearing uh, all these hats. Uh, I know, I know, but, but only just to get it to you. Okay, good. <laughs> there you go. Cool. And uh, the thing about bass playing is uh, sometimes I'll bring my pedal board, and I'll go in two inputs and I'll keep my clean sound and I have the effects going. Sometimes I have everything going into one track with the effects being, being there, but it depends on your song. And trying to make sure, that's like I was talking about Bob Clearmountain. What I learned from working with him is it all starts at the source. If you make your, think your lines through about what you want for the song and make it as, 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 as feel as good as possible mm -hmm. with a good tone and some even playing, and then it's going to pull the song off. And you know, it's really simple. It's good to go into a preamp, just like what we talked about before. The 737 Avalon is a great uh, uh, pre for the bass. The, uh, the BA, the Brent Averroes, which is what I use. I use those sometimes for the bass. And uh, sometimes I just go right in the Pro Tools, but it's not as good as going through the, mm. the pre's. And you know, and you can experiment. Like uh, I actually talked to the guy at Avalon, and he gave me some great uh, tips on settings for like bass so I can get like a better sound because I used to hate to add the add the, uh, the uh, tones from the Avalon. What, what's your take on that? Uh, man, just whatever works. You know me, I don't, I, just, yeah. I, I, I mix like you play, just whatever feels good. Okay. But what I would so say, simple, what yeah. I would say, uh, thank you for asking, what I would say is is don't don't use tiny little bandwidths. Do do broader things and do very little. Less is more in the recording yeah. part because if you if you create too many little spikes and peaks in the sound, then it makes it a much more difficult to create any sound you want later when you and mix. And you can't get rid of it, right? Now, yeah. Now also, having said that, I'm probably the biggest believer in the music industry about commitment. I believe that if you don't, if you're not confident enough record the part as you want to hear it, then record something else. That's a sign that you've got the right part. And when you commit to that part, commit to that part. But, but, but at the same time, I'm, I'm saying be careful about those spikes and peaks because those are harder for, 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 for a mix engineer to, to blend into different concepts later on. Give, yeah. us, give us one more ITL question to, so he can show us some technique and then warm up your arm for batter's box. Okay. Um, of all the people I know that, that, that play the instrument, um, I've never seen anybody so flawlessly and seamlessly move from gospel to jazz to rock. You come from a gospel family. There's about 800,000 of you C's. His oh, last yeah. name is C. And, and like more and more on Facebook, I see like 20, <laughs> 20 new ones every day. Uh, okay. and, uh, uh, did we, we, we didn't mention Blackfoot yet, did we? You did. Okay. Yeah. Well, Blackfoot, um, uh, Ricky Medlock is now in Skinner. I mean, they're, they're like in the South. We're, they're a revered rock band. And, and, and Wizard and his brother were the rhythm section for that band. And then he turns around and plays with the funkiest funk bands. Play a bass line funk style, and then play it rock style, and then play it gospel style. The same bass line. I think funk style. Can um, you do? Is that possible? Sure. He's a wizard. Yeah, that's right. Let me think about what it should be, though. <laughs> <laughs> you do a moment to think about it. But, yeah. uh, uh, when you say funk, see, like I'm, I'm, I'm. When I mean funk is like it's, it's a broad category. It's a broad category. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, let's see. I'll help. I'll help you out. Play yeah, it. Help me out, please. Play it. Um, <laughs> play it. Play it cameo, play it um, living color, and then play it wizard. Oh man, that's all the same. You made it work. <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everything. Yeah, you know, cameo did have a lot of rock in it, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that that kind of stuff like that. Right, right, and like if it was rock. It's almost like uh, Watch My Style and that Mother Sinus song that was way back. Uh, I mean, all you know, every lick that I hear yeah, derives like, from... Like, like in, in, in rock, you would still do this and a little less of this? or would you use, I've never seen you use a pick, but like for rock, would I you ever use a pick? I use a pick when I record. 
when I when I record, sometimes if it needs a pick up, you know, it was amazing. I, I was at a Colombian whoa, whoa, wedding. Whoa, 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 whoa! That was a pretty deep sentence. Let me expand on that. That's a huge sentence for us. So, in order to get the sound you want in recording, you would use a pick, whereas yeah. live you would use your fingers. What do you get from from that? Explain to our audience what you would get tonally from that. Uh, a pick has got like a, a definition about it. It's really precise, and, uh, and, and just the definition, like it's, it's very clean. You have to really hear the lines more in your head before you play it, which is what I try to always do. Some players always play first before they think about what they're going to do, and I try to think about what I want to do first and then play it. But a pick is, the, the definition of a pick is amazing. So you'd use the pick more for rock as opposed to R&B? No, I use it for R&B too. Oh, it okay. depends on what it is. I was uh, hanging out with the bass player Klaus Vorman. Oh wow! Yeah, he's the guy. He drew the the uh, the rubber soul cover. He actually he's an artist. I that's didn't his know penciling. That. Yeah, that's his penciling. He played on Imagine. He played on uh, he did all the John Lennon stuff, a ton of George uh, Harrison stuff, and he and, and he played even uh, I think he played a Beatle track or something. But but he um, he turned me on to like that song uh, called. Uh, you're so vain by mm. what's his Carly what's, Simon. Carly Simon, that's him on that. And he, he uses a piece of foam, which I have in my pad right here. I hate giving this secret away because this is so valuable. Ooh. Man, it's, but it's Pensado's place. There are no secrets. This is, is Pensado's place. I think I said here. Yeah, right. Except I just keep for this. what Drew did last time. This night. right here, he puts this underneath. And this is what they used to do with bases, like when they had that big silver piece. That used to come on a bass, you know, yeah, and yeah, you would flip yeah. the thing, but, but it it, it it show show that up here so they can see where it is. Yeah, see, like it it just completely tight mutes the string to where there's no ring. Uh, you know that? Wow. But like it's so tight and clean, mm -hmm. and he used this on all those hits, and he said I always did that. Wow. And he said that's what uh, they used to do at Motown a lot. They 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 would mute the strings, so that you, especially when um. Uh, What's the what's the what's the Motown bass player the famous uh, Oh gosh. You know, oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, well anyway, he was really busy all the time. Mm -hmm. But you could hear everything he was doing. And it was because there was no ring to it. And they would mute the ring out. Uh, that's what Pensado's play scoop. No question. It's something like this. Uh, Jameson. James Jameson. James Jameson, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I used to, I see his son on his son's absolutely. a brilliant bass player too. Mm -hmm. But James absolutely. Jameson is historic. That's what Paul McCartney gets so much from and so many players, but he used to mute the sound, and then he could just play tons of licks and stuff, and it would always come across because well, his groove was so good. First of all, yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, oh man, I had I had like the best question I was going to ask all day, and I just lost it. Well, it'll yeah, come back. Yeah. Drugs in the seventies. Don't do drugs. I'm just kidding. I don't do. I don't do drugs. <laughs> um, it was funnier when they did that on, skit on Living Color. All right, batter's box, are you ready? I, I think I'm ready. Okay. okay. Uh, word association, I'm just going to say it. You tell me what you think. Okay. Bass. Larry Graham. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. There's ten one. of these. You can't answer Larry Graham for every one. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm going I'm to I'm get you. Modern okay. bass player. Uh, Anthony Wellington. Ooh. You know this guy? I know of him, I don't know him. This guy's like, God, he is so... Tell, uh, tell our audience real quick. Anthony Wellington, like, he has uh, workshops online. And just pull up Anthony Wellington and... Uh, Anthony, you, you owe me for this. Uh, but, like, he's so informative about... That's not Jazz. <laughs> uh, Jocko Pastorius. Oh, gosh. I got to stop him. Miles Davis, yeah. We're from Miami. Jocko was, like, from Miami, the greatest... Yeah, oh, Jocko is amazing. Sad, Sad, sad story. I met he him when away. I was like 14 years old, yeah. But you know what's, what's not sad about it is what he did for bass. He changed he the way changed we hear bass. bass. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Classic rock. Whoa, Led Zeppelin? I just don't like him. Um, <laughs> your favorite artist. Oh. I love Zeppelin. I just, just uh, John Paul just overplays. I love that guy. Uh, my favorite artist? God, I mean, I have like tons of... Give me one of your top five favorite. Top five, Hendrix. Hello. Okay. Uh, your favorite brand of strings? GHS. <laughs> I've been endorsing for like thirty years. <laughs> how, often you, how often do you change them? Um, when I'm touring, I every three shows, pretty much change. Favorite stomp pedal box? Uh, 
Digitech whammy pedal. Really? Yeah, I love that, that red thing. One? That red one with all of the different. Oh wow! Man, you get some. Man, I get some science fiction with that thing. It's you guys amazing. better head to, head to eBay fast. It just went up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, speaking of Jocko, who's your favorite? Who's your biggest influence when you were starting out? Whoa, my brother Edward. Mm. Wow, that's sweet. How yeah. many brothers and sisters do you have? Like twenty. I 20? have five brothers and six sisters. There's oh, twelve man. of us. What was what was the favorite gig you ever played? And the Who played... tour, the Who tour. Uh, Keith Moon was still alive. We played a show in Phoenix, and uh, Keith Moon and Roger Daltrey got in a fight on stage. Oh wow! And uh, and uh, the guitar player uh, uh, Townsend, Townsend had to <laughs> pick uh, Keith Moon up by the seat of his pants and threw him back, and the audience was like. You know, look at it, you know, because they didn't know if it was a show or if it was whatever. It was right in the middle of, see me, oh, feel man. me. And then Keith Moon jumped in the back, and he said, I had enough. And he jumped, he jumped And I was like, yeah, I mean, they, they were throwing punches. And then uh, he went back to the drums, and they finished the suck. And I mean, it was a great show. Wow. I mean, even the fight was amazing. But I, you know, and, and then when they went backstage, they all went to their separate dressing rooms, and, uh, and I guess they, they sealed it up because we played two nights later, and it was great again. Drew, hit us with one question really quickly, oh, okay. and we got to go. All right, on the spot. Uh, okay, that's good. From Bob Wells, are there any differences with playing outside North America that have influenced what you do? Playing outside North America? Yeah. That helps. Like, uh, I don't that, understand, that, I don't understand it. Oh, okay. Are there, any differ or are there any differences with playing outside North America that have influenced what you do? Anything overseas that, you, that you've been playing over there? That I would do different than... No, that here? just influence how, uh, your playing. Anything you've picked up overseas. Maybe this will answer it. I, I feel more freedom when I play in Europe. For some reason, I feel like I'm more... Uh, uh, you know, something that happened, like when we got inducted into the Hall of Fame, the Georgia Music Hall of Fame, after it was said and done, after a week went by, and Samuel L. Jackson was there talking about he was one of, I mean, we were one of his favorite bands and stuff. It was like, a, it, it kind of made, I think it must be how you, after you got your, 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 your 23rd Grammy, mm -hmm. you say, maybe I am <laughs> worthy, you know? I, I, I mean, but you know. Worthy, but yeah, I know yeah but saying. I mean, you know, but it, it, it's not, it just gives you confidence to completely, Trust your ideas. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing. Yeah, and, big and, thing. And, 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 and I think it's very necessary. When I'm playing outside of North America, I feel like my ideas are accepted quicker and more fully. Wiz, um, will you come back? Oh, please. I love it here, man. God. I, I tell you what. Oh, man. It's uh, marvelous. Uh, marvelous. I learned marvelous. so much. You're an inspiration. I hope. We uh, didn't talk about the postmodern, man. <laughs> oh, man. Don't embarrass me. Oh, was, come on. That was, that was, Another band I was in. If you talk to bands, talk about killer this, guitar talk player. About, uh, I knew him when he was when he was mainly a guitar player. Oh my God. And you were engineering just to get your music to take. Yeah, take, right? that's how I started. Yeah. The dinosaurs were still roaming. <laughs> 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 well, and Eileen Burns using all those great oh. masters for like commercials. Oh man! Oh man! She was using masters. Uh, I, I can, I can tell you now, the studio, I, uh, one of the studios I got my start at, the 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 lady that owned it, her husband had done. Uh, he wrote uh, uh, Neil Diamond. He wrote Peace of My Heart. Hang like, on, they Snoopy, Peace of My Heart. Hang on, so I'd yeah. sneak back there and get all the masters from like uh, all these great massive hits, and I that's what I'd mix. I'd practice mixing mm. them, and of course I I ruined the mixes. Uh, but finally, I got to where I thought I was getting pretty good after a couple of years. That's actually the outlier concept which came up in Mixed Fest. But we won't do that now. We've got to get out of here. Uh, guys, four weeks, December 15th, 1073, oh, Vintage we King. About, uh, about Whatever you do, you got 10 seconds. No. Um, we're going to figure out our Thanksgiving show. It's next week. So we'll figure that out. We'll be here, but we'll figure out how we're going to do that. Um, we want to thank Wizard for sure. Wizard. You'll come back. I love this place. Absolutely. Um, love, love, love to everybody in Mother's <laughs> Finest. What oh, yeah. you saw when I was holding this up was a way to enter underneath, so make sure you do that. And uh, Dave, take us home. Okay, guys. Um, just can't say enough. Uh, if you got friends like Wizard and you should try to get a few, uh, you just can't fail in this business because of all the lows I went through, uh, through encouragement and support. Wizard, Wizard knew me when I started. He knew me. I don't think when we met, I don't even think I started engineering. He got me through some rough times, so 
Get your friend like Wizard and you'll be as success successful as I am. In fact, I'll give you Wizard's address. Just email me. Bye-bye, guys. Thanks for mentioning this.